I successfully designed a half-broken circuit. Here's what went wrong and how I'm going to fix it. This project is sponsored by PCBWay. The circuit I just messed up is supposed to be an evolution of this other simpler color organ I made almost two years ago using these simple passive filters followed by transistor drivers that would turn on an LED showing the presence of low, mid, or high frequencies of audio. So when you play music, when there's bass, one light will come on, and so on. And this original circuit worked, but I wanted to improve it, maybe modifying the three different low, mid, and high frequency ranges. And also I wanted these transistors to turn on stronger because the audio passing through was barely triggering them. So I could only get so much current through them to turn on an LED. I just wanted all of this to be better. So I thought I would turn it into an active op amp filter, op amp input buffer, and a better transistor driver. So the new design uses op amps for the input and the filters has a more elaborate transistor driver for these low, mid, and high LEDs, so I can get a much better filter pass band response. I can boost the signal coming through here to turn on the transistors better, and I can control a tighter pass band if I want compared to the more passive filter. But the first design flaw that I made here, I used the wrong ground reference for this transistor circuit here. And the end result was the LEDs were all always on instead of only coming on momentarily when these different frequency ranges were present. So we'll look at why that happened and how to fix it. The whole circuit depended on particularly this transistor here being connected to this virtual ground. So without that, this design would not have a chance of working. So it was really just a clerical error here. And this virtual ground comes from here. I'm powering the op amps from 5 volts, and then I'm creating a virtual ground reference for the op amps at 2.5 volts, just using a simple resistor divider. And what that does is allow us to take our input AC audio signal, which goes above and below 0 volts, and we are shifting this op amp reference up to 2.5. So now the audio signal goes above and below 2.5 volts all the way through the circuit path. So if there's no audio present, really this level here should be around 2.5 volts waiting for a signal. And aside from any small drops here with the resistances and this diode, if we always have at least 2.5 volts here, and then with audio it'll go somewhat above and somewhat below, but it's still probably always at least one volt minimum. With this emitter at ground, zero volts, the base emitter junction here is always seeing more than the 0.7 volts or so needed to turn it on. So it kept the LEDs always on. What I need to do is reference this emitter at least to 2.5 volts. Then when there's no audio or a weak audio signal, it's not enough voltage above 2.5 to turn on this transistor. And with an op amp, when there is a valid frequency of audio getting through this filter, it's going to have gain. So it's going to be boosted more than the original audio. And that's finally going to bring the bass high enough above the 2.5 reference to turn on the transistor and turn on the LED to show those audio frequencies have now made it through this filter or this filter or this filter. So I'm going to need to revise this and I'm going to make a new PCB in the future. But for now, because basically most of this circuit works up to these test points here, so I'm assembling this much of the current PCB and I'm going to rebuild this transistor driver part on a breadboard using the proper references and make sure everything is good. So another oversight, now that I want to actually 
be able to sync current with this 2.5 volt reference in order to turn on transistors, I'm also going to need to improve this virtual ground circuit. Normally when all I'm doing is providing a reference voltage straight to an op amp input with high impedance, I can get away with something like this. But now if I'm going to be actually drawing significant current through this, from these transistors, this voltage is no longer going to be stable. So I'm gonna, on the breadboard, put an op amp buffer after this and provide a more ideal low impedance voltage source. And the op amp is capable of syncing and sourcing enough current to handle what these transistors want to do with this virtual ground. So I have to build this on the breadboard as well. Otherwise, just looking at this circuit, we're going to have audio, or in my case for now, I'm using a sine wave function generator set for maybe a couple hundred millivolts here. And it's just a simple buffer with gain. So if I have a weak signal, I can amplify it, or if the signal's too strong, I can attenuate it and make the whole thing work smoothly. So this is a standard inverting amplifier configuration. And this resistor to ground, on the non-inverting input may be optional in some cases. And especially because I tend to put sockets on the boards, I may want to experiment with a different op amp. So this 1K resistor is here arbitrarily, but it's there for potential use in case we have some offset voltage errors. So generally this resistor would be chosen in value to be the parallel combination of the input and the feedback resistor, or a best guess if this is a potentiometer and it could vary. But either way, it should probably not be more than 1K or else you start having to do things like add a bypass capacitor with it. So I just wanted to keep things simple and I threw a 1K there. All of these three op amp circuits are bandpass filters. I have two here that are multiple feedback path configuration, and the final one is different. It's more like a high pass filter with gain with these two resistors, and then with the capacitor in the feedback loop, it just starts rolling off higher frequencies, so it ends up becoming a bandpass filter. So how these values were chosen, I used this convenient online filter calculator for the multiple feedback filter that I'm using. And I didn't have an exact bunch of frequencies I wanted to definitely pass or block in each low, mid, and high range. I just simply started out saying, for the low frequencies, let's make the center of the filter 120 hertz. And I basically experimented, I, I said, Let's make a gain of 15. And the Q of the filter, I just ended up choosing five. And it calculated these resistor capacitor values, which are the ones I ended up using. So down here, looking at the frequency response, I'm boosting above zero, which is no gain. When we're passing frequencies through the filter, I want it to have gain so I can turn on those other transistors. And just playing with the actual circuit once I built it, right here, this line is 100 hertz, and the next one down is 90 hertz. 90 hertz is when I started getting my LED to turn on. So if I look at the gain magnitude here, it's about 15 dB. And also if I continue on to the other end of this passband, 15 dB lands at about 150 hertz, halfway between 100 and 200 on this graph. So if I have a gain of 15 dB or more in this passband, my LED is on, showing me that I'm getting a frequency between 90 hertz and 150 hertz. So I didn't design it for that, it's just how it turned out with the level of the sine wave I put in and how I adjusted the level on this buffer here. I'm getting 90 to 150 hertz through this filter strong enough to turn on the transistor, which turns on this one that drives the LED with as much current as I want to give it. And looking at the mid-range filter, I wrote down here, the LED is coming on between 190 hertz and 550 hertz. So looking at these component values, I had arbitrarily said I want my mid-range center frequency to be around 400 hertz. And again, I chose the gain of 15. And this time I chose a Q of three. 
and it gave me these component values, which are the ones I used for the mid passband. And between the gain and the Q, that basically ends up controlling how sharp this filter response can get. So with this lower Q, I'm still getting this maximum gain up here, but I'm able to actually pass a wider range of frequencies because I made the Q lower and the pass band gets wider. So also give or take for component tolerances. In this filter, I noticed my LED was starting to come on at about 190 hertz, where the center is at 400. So this is 100, 200, 300, 400. The filter started allowing the transistor to turn on around 190 hertz. And I noticed the LED turned off after about 550 hertz. So that would be getting close to here, close to 600 between here and here. So that's basically the pass band that I'm able to detect with this particular filter using these component values and those design specs. So I'm just basically loosely targeting an area and what I get is what I get. It's not that critical. And looking at this different bandpass filter structure, I may want to tweak this still. I'm not sure if 1.8 kilohertz as a starting frequency is already too high and there's a big gap between 550 hertz and 1.8k. I may want to bring this down. So looking at how these values are chosen, I found this online filter calculator for this sort of structure. And so this resistor and capacitor in the feedback loop is responsible for the low cutoff frequency, 1 over 2 pi, this resistor times this capacitor, and the input series RC is responsible for the high cutoff frequency, which would be 1 over 2 pi, this resistor, this capacitor, and the gain of this filter is this resistor divided by this resistor as an inverting op amp with gain. So I just arbitrarily chose some specifications. Basically, I wanted it to really act as a high pass filter. So once we get into passing high frequencies, I wanted it to pass any audio high frequencies beyond that. But it's always good to limit the maximum frequency of an op amp circuit. So I did want to make it a band pass so that that eventually at higher frequencies it would roll off. So I arbitrarily went near the maximum audio range and knowing that this is still going to turn on the transistors probably before the minus 3 dB cutoff. I just went with 2.4 kilohertz and it gave me these resistor capacitor values which I used in this circuit, the closest practical values right here. So in reality, it started turning on the LED at 1.8 kilohertz, and that website didn't have a simulation result, so I put this into LT Spice, and the end result is our peak gain here is around 18.8, .8, close to 19 dB. So if I'm looking for the lower and higher cutoffs, which are going to be minus 3 dB, I'm looking for where it's 15.8 dB. So 15.8 dB right here is actually around 1.8 kilohertz where I'm getting the LED turning on. And if I continue to look for the upper cutoff at 15.8 dB, that's close to 20 kilohertz, which is the upper audio range anyway. And beyond that, we just attenuate. So this was all kind of arbitrary trial and error. Still may want to adjust it depending how it works. And as for this little circuit here, right now I'm not using this capacitor and this diode, so this is just a short circuit. But I'm going to experiment with this because I may not want the LED to immediately turn off abruptly when this frequency disappears. If I want to simulate something like an incandescent or a halogen bulb that kind of fades out and dims away gradually. This will allow me to have a peak detector so I get audio passing through and it charges this capacitor depending what value I use. Then the diode will hopefully prevent the capacitor from discharging when the signal drops and the transistor will gradually turn off and the LED hopefully fades out giving me the effect I want. But I still have to work on that. So considering I had to redesign this on the breadboard, I didn't bother fully testing everything and 
calculating or calibrating for all the optimal component values yet, since I'm changing the whole grounding structure here, it's going to impact what I was originally going to do. So I'll continue working on all of that and updating the schematic as well as getting this buffered virtual ground. And we will revisit this again for version 3 of trying to get this color organ sorted out.